On July 4th, Soapy was at the height of his power and popularity. Everyone loved Captain Jefferson Randolph Smith, and he, uh, he drilled his army, continued to drill them through the streets. Four days later, everything changed for Soapy. And that's when J.D. Stewart, John Douglas Stewart, was robbed of his gold. And what had happened, he was rooming in the Mondeman Hotel, room number 51. And Soapy was rooming in room number 61. So they were in the same hotel. Stewart put his $2,700 of gold, which is uh, the equivalent of of $88,000 today, a lot of money. But he had the proprietor of the hotel put it in the safe. But Stewart didn't know that the proprietor and Soapy were friends. So immediately, the proprietor told Soapy, J.D. Stewart, room 51, lots of gold. So the following day, Bowers or one of the other gangsters met up with Stewart, introduced himself as an essayer in, from Seattle and had an office here in Skagway and insisted that he could get Stewart a better exchange rate, cash for gold, than he could in Seattle where everyone else was going. Stewart bit and Bowers took him to his office. But as they were walking, they passed the front of Jeff Smith's parlor. And Bowers looked down the alleyway beside Jeff Smith's parlor and saw two men playing a game. So he enticed Stewart, let's go investigate. And that was Old Man Tripp and Slim Jim Foster. And they were playing three card Monty. They swindled Stewart out of $75. Now that should have been the end of it. Many thousands of people in 1898 in Skagway were swindled with the uh, three-card Monty, the shell game, and others. But the gang was at their height of power and popularity, and they thought they could get away with anything. So Bowers asked Stewart, let him hold that gold poke. He wanted to feel the heft of the gold. So Stewart did. Bowers immediately tossed the poke to old man Tripp and said, get, and the con men got. So within seconds, Stewart was left alone in the alleyway, penniless, and he was angry. He screamed, literally, went through the streets telling everybody he could about the gold loss. Soon, the merchants who backed Soapy were now opposing him, and they joined the Vigilante Committee of 101. This upset Soapy very much. Four days earlier, he was the hero of Skagway. Everybody admired him. And now he was a common thief. So he started drinking that day of the 8th on the morning, and he didn't stop drinking. By the evening, the vigilantes had formed a meeting on Juno Company Wharf. That evening, one of the gang members handed Soapy a note, and it said that there were men on the wharf and that if he wanted to do anything, he had to do it now. And Soapy did. He gathered up eight of his gang members and grabbed his rifle a Winchester rifle, and walked down State Street towards Juno Company Wharf. About 60 yards from the opening of the wharf, he turned and had his man, men, uh, he turned and had his men hold back because he felt it would be better if he went to the vigilante meeting alone. He had bluffed so many people, half his life, and he felt he could do it again. And chances are, had he survived, he probably would have been able to bluff his way out of the trouble that he was in at the moment. 
So he entered the wharf area. There were four vigilante guards. The first one he came across was John Landers, and he was on the left side of the wharf against the railing. He told John to get off the wharf. I, I would guess that he meant to walk off the wharf, but John Landers was very frightened. He jumped over the railing. The next two people that Soapy came up upon were J.M. Tanner and a railroad worker by the name of Jesse Murphy. They did not move. Soapy ignored them. He continued on and ran into or faced off with Frank H. Reed. Reed raised his hand and said, Jeff, you can't go down there. You don't tell Captain Smith what he can and can't do. So they argue, and they were face to face, and that's when everything went wrong. Soapy and Frank argued. Soapy tired very quickly of the argument. He was bound and determined to deal with the vigilantes, not Frank H. Reed. So he took his rifle, which was on his shoulder, not to shoot Frank, but to buffalo him, to hit him with the barrel of that rifle, knock him out of the way so that he could continue on. But something happened that Soapy didn't expect at all. Frank Reed, with his left hand, grabbed that barrel from hitting him and jerked it down. At that point, Frank Reed reached into a pocket and pulled out a revolver. He aimed it at Soapy. Click. Nothing happened. It fell on a faulty cartridge. So I can imagine Soapy just saw his life go right before his eyes. So now the two men are really struggling very violently. Reed is trying to recock his pistol to shoot it. Soapy is trying to get his rifle in control. Up to eight shots were fired in all. And Soapy was hit in the left leg. Frank Reed was hit in the right leg. Soapy was hit in the arm. And this all while they're trying to control that rifle. And Soapy was able to get the rifle in front of Frank Reed's groin and fired a shot. That instantly paralyzed Frank Reed. And he fell forward. He was out of the game. He died 12 days later of his wound. Soapy, wounded, fell to the dock, but he still had control of his rifle. Now, I imagine him thinking, okay, that's it. I quit. They can have Skagway. I'm going home. But then Jesse Murphy ran up and he grabbed hold of Soapy's rifle. So the two men are struggling for control of Soapy's rifle. Finally, Murphy gets it out of Soapy's hands and turns it on him. And that's when my great-grandfather said, my God, don't shoot. And Jesse Murphy shot him in the heart at point-blank range. And that was how Soapy Smith was killed. <laughs>